So, hello everyone. I'm Simon Briggs. As you can see upon the screen there, there's my email address. And you can probably tell by the abundance of bright green that's offending your retinas at the moment. An organization called SUSE. They're pretty big in the open source world. So, if you're interested in us, hunt us out. We're down in the marketplace. Always happy to talk to people about OpenStack and other open source projects. Um, I work for them as the Europe, Middle East, and Africa specialist around cloud technologies. And um, as you see there, I've got a Twitter handle as well, so um, you can always um, follow things. So I've forgotten my slide, sorry. I'm also jet lagged. <laughs> um, I've been in IT now, just to explain why I'm stood up in front of you talking to you. I've been in software providers, vendors. Um, for just about 17 years. So I'm pretty experienced working around those kind of organizations. Um, and I mainly have been what's called a sales engineer. You might know a sales engineer as a pre-seller. There's different words for the kind of jobs that I've done. Effectively, what I've done is help salesmen understand technology and how that fits into customers' environments. So I tend to do quite a lot of architecture work. And with uh, me specializing nowadays around OpenStack Cloud, it's the rationale for talking to you about the subject matter today, about why ARM is a, as a chipset is probably something that you've not particularly seriously thought about in the core pieces of your clouds, but might actually now be a facet that you need to understand. Okay? So, um, I'm a keen advocate of open source. I wanted to call this out. I worked on Linux for many, many years. Um, and I started my OpenStack journey around Essex when SUSE got involved. My eyes opened to what it might be potentially able to do for us. And I started talking to my customers about those benefits. Um, you probably noticed I am British. Um, and that kind of keys in nicely into the reason why I might be interested in ARM, and I might want to talk to you about their capabilities, and we'll go into that um, in a little bit of detail. But essentially, I started out my tech life, or uh, became a geek, <laughs> because I liked ARM technology back in the day. Okay. Now, I was hoping this might be a smaller room. I didn't realize Boston's quite as big as it is because I wanted it to be a bit more conversational. Um, so um, I have been willing to step forward and talk about this subject, but I don't perceive myself as the oracle and the genius about this technology. I've worked with it a bit. I understand it. Been away with it for a few years. Um, but if somebody knows better, and I do see one of the guys from ARM sat in front of me, Please speak up, correct me. I won't be embarrassed, it's fine. Uh, it'll take about 30, 35 minutes to talk about the technology. Um, and I do ramble, I apologize. I ramble even more when I'm jet lagged. So hopefully you can put up with that and I won't offend you too greatly. Um, at the end, there will be some time for questions. You can use the mics. Everything's being recorded, so it's best to use the mics. Um, so it will be captured for the, the replays and things like that. So why this session? Why, why did I want to talk to you as an architect about what ARM chipset technology might be able to do for you? And really, I'm motivated by the fact I'm not a very keen person when I realize there's a monopoly in a market, OK? I'm into open source because I believe in the power of um, lots and lots of choices. And Really, the chipset market, particularly around OpenStack and server market, has been dominated in recent years by the Intel chips. And there's nothing wrong with that. Intel has come up with a solution which has worked for the market and has made them dominant. But on the other hand, there are other options out there. And I always think that if you're getting up into the 93% domination of a market, you might need somebody else to go in there spin or change the situation in that market and shake it up a little bit. And that's really why I'm so interested in this technology. 
Obviously, other technologies were there. It was a varied um, market back in the day. So if you look at the uh, graph there, we're talking about 2000. It was quite varied. But really, in the last 10, 12 years, it really has shifted to the point that we need something different to be able to balance out the market in my eyes. You might, might not believe that, but it's important that you also educate yourself to understand what choices are out there when you're architecting clouds, to understand where things might fit, what benefits might work for you according to the particular use case you use. So who are ARM? I'm sorry about the green thing in the middle there. That shouldn't be there. <laughs> so ARM are a UK-based company. They've been around for many, many years, and that's why I got interested in them, as a, in them as a young man, and you'll see something about that in a little bit more detail. They also take a very interesting approach to the market of building um, technology. So effectively, um, they develop architecture um, and then license that capability, that design out to other organizations. They, um, their genesis, I believe, was around some of the technology startups that took place around the University of Cambridge in England um, back in the late 70s, early 80s. It was a very famous company if you're from the UK and of my vintage, the grey hair tells you something, um, where uh, they were called Acorn Computing. They were involved, they got broken up due to different things happening. Um, and out of the ashes, um, and due to other investments and um, uh, um, thought processes, ARM was created. They're very, very influential, and a key to why they are so is um, they specialize in reduced instruction set computing chips. Okay, and we'll go into more detail around how the licensing model plus the architecture that they've approached the market with has allowed quite a lot of versatility. And that versatility is something which is now starting to become more and more relevant if you're building large clouds. It also, and this is the bit of the journey for why Simon Briggs, me, is quite interested in technology, it was also a chip which ran in a very old-fashioned computer. And I was hoping there'd be more. There's quite a few youthful faces, but there'd be even more, because I'm going to show you that computer now. Doesn't it look archaic? But that was state of the art when I was a young man in about 1985. And there's me in 1985. On the right-hand side, I'm in the, the middle of those five gentlemen at the back going out, having a party with my friends. So I was young once, I promise you. And as I was growing up, I, I did grow up in Yorkshire, so I say when I were a lad, or for the English guys, you might understand that pun. Um, but I got to use my first ever computer around a friend's house. He was called Stephen Featherston, great friend, and he saved up all his pocket money from doing a paper round, which if you're very young, you might want to ask your granddads about. It's a thing we used to do to earn money. And he saved up all that money and he got himself one of these BBC micro computers and I got to play on it. And it was one of those revelations, getting time in front of a computer, that actually changed my life. I went from probably working in an agricultural community to actually ending up being somebody involved in technology. So that's why I'm really interested in it. But the reason why I want to talk to you about it today is 30 odd years later, this technology set is getting more and more relevant, okay? And there's several use cases inside the cloud where it might be applicable for you to be aware of what it might be able to give you. Not telling you it's perfect, just talking about understanding the choices and working forward with it. So we've talked about the fact ARM licenses their technology. It's an IP company, essentially. It designs, comes up with designs, and then allows other people to license them 
and use that flexibility in the licensing model to add value to that particular element. That allows organizations generally to specialize what they're trying to achieve with that technology and make the um, overall solution very effective. A lot of what they've done with their partners is allow the partners to build what's being called in the industry system on a chip. And that's probably a bit more relevant as we walk through the story of the different areas they touch in clouds. The partners, there's something like 1,600, I believe. That might be a number that is slightly wrong nowadays, and I might be corrected by Andrew at the front here later. Um, but let me just say, there are far too many for me to mention. So I call out one or two companies that I've worked with in my SUSE life because they're partners of ours and whatever. That isn't because I'm doing anyone down. So if you're working for another vendor that works as a partner, that's brilliant. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm only pulling out my own experience whilst talking to you, okay? As I say, the flexibility of the design model does allow organizations to specialize. So where organizations are partners uh, and licensees of the ARM technology, they might produce a particular device or capability which is a single use case. Or they might be quite broad. They might design things to have several different use cases and several different types of chip help them achieve that. But certainly, they are um, across the industry, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So they have been around. You're probably aware, I think most people in our kind of industry are, is they've been very strong about mobile computing and devices. But to be honest, I think a lot of organizations and people have discounted them from other areas of computing, such as networking and server, essential components within your cloud setup. And within server, they are also relevant on storage as well. So if you're using software-defined storage, again, there is some relevance there. It's an architectural choice you need to be aware of. I was just at the bottom there. With the mobile technology, they are highly successful. This is a number that I've picked up in some of my research, and over 50 billion ARM processors were in the market in 2014. Very, very impressive. But they are actually going around other markets and becoming um, quite influential. So if you combine the licensing model, the ability to allow partners to be very flexible about how they apply that use case, and then look at what the capabilities might be, you get a very varied, a very varied capability set. So vendors deliver up to 96 cores per socket. So density is a possibility with this technology, which is very, very powerful. Although they might just deliver a single, a couple, very low levels. There's some very unique ARM server implementations out there in the market now. And that's partly why it's become more relevant for me in my job as a cloud architect and probably for you guys. They have the flexibility um, to build their own products. And that means they can build against certain workloads. So where they have moved into the server technology market, they are picking off certain workloads. So we walk through some of them while we're doing this slide demonstration, but a good example is high performance compute. We'll go into that in a bit later. But the very simple architecture, the reduced or the risk um, architecture set um, allows organizations to get the level of density that you've got above because they aren't building technology for the legacy capabilities that other chip providers are building. And that's one of the key things you need to understand when thinking about what they do. They are different to what you've probably been used to up until this point, particularly if you've come from a data center server background. Okay. With that density and that reduced instruction set on the chip itself, they don't have to expend as much energy across the whole surface of the chip, keeping up with those legacy capabilities. 
So actually the vendors who are licensees of their technology are able to really tune down the amount of power that goes into these chips. They can also tune down the amount of cost that lays in there. And because of that, the diversity is huge. As I say, HPC is an interesting area because of the high density and the high core count. And then, of course, there are other use cases that are becoming very familiar to those people working within OpenStack, such as network function, virtualization, storage, um, and many, many others. But not to discount the devices I talked about earlier. So actually, they're very good on mobile, but that also means that the chipset's very powerful for devices. Internet of Things is obviously one of the use cases that OpenStack is particularly predisposed to be capable of delivering. And the devices that you might roll out in building that kind of mesh that for information being gathered, etc., could in involve many elements, A ATM, CNCs. They are literally use cases across every walk of industry um, where technology helps them. So within um, the mobile market, the devices market, they have 95% um, of the smartphones that we use day to day. We're touching them every few minutes when we're working away. And these things, 95% of them are using some ARM technology within them, which is an incredible amount and actually makes that organization a very strong organization allows it to make profits, which allows them to invest um, in other capability. What I didn't realize when I started out doing the research is they're also in all our smart TVs that we're using, or many of them. Um, and of course, they, they're out there on microprocessors, single-use devices. So you've probably got, today in your household, when you use technology, you've probably got tens of these, um, these chips already operating within your homes. And within businesses, that's going to be hundreds, if not thousands. One of the interesting things that's come about on the back of the investments with, um, um, in Cambridge in the UK is the um, delivery to the market of the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is an interesting project. I think a lot of us who are interested in technology have followed how it's developed. And actually it's the small form factor use case compute, which is becoming very popular with enthusiasts. And also I'm finding more and more com conversations happening in enterprises where they're talking about an IoT use case where they see Raspberry Pi might be useful. So what might have been perceived as peripheral to our very serious data center orchestration cloud model is more and more becoming more relevant as we're working. Those IoT devices that might be out there also need gateways, consolidators, information paths need to route back to somewhere to be stored for it to be useful. Those gateways can obviously work in this way. I mentioned ATMs earlier. Apparently, most ATMs carry this technology as well. But the more interesting area for me as a cloud architect is the server and the networking elements. And this is actually an ARM slide. It's taken from an ARM presentation in 2015. I couldn't get more up-to-date data. Um, but effectively, on the left-hand side, they're talking about where the um, ARM chip has a presence in the server market in 2015 in the top left-hand side there. So a $15 billion market, and they've got 1% in 2015. I don't know what the numbers are this year. I would hazard a guess that's a lot more than the 1%. But certainly, they've identified it in the bottom of that purple um, column as a key market for them to exploit and become more profitable. So that mobile and device engine in the business is now creating wealth for them to reinvest and take on more technology. So they've invested in different um, organizations and brought them into the fold. They've been invested into by 
um, a Chinese conglomerate with much more financial power, and they, they are setting out their view to be 25%, no, 15%, 25%, 25% of the server market in 2020. So they've got high aims. They want to be relevant to you as cloud architects. And actually, the networking market, which they've been present in for many, many years, hasn't gone away from their point of view. And actually, as this illustrates, is even more vital to them. So going into what um, traditionally is a market that they've been very relevant in, networking. So they were already established in the network device market for many years. So, so there's quite a few vendors. And that's 15% of the market in 2015. But they want to move quickly to um, consolidate their position in that market. And because of that, they've got many more partners in that particular industry set using their technologies. But also, that industry is coming back towards them as well, partly because of the advances that OpenStack and other cloud initiatives are bringing to be capabilities for software-defined networking, network function virtualization. Some of the vendors in that space, Mellanox, HP, Cabium, they're people I've worked with. I know they've got platforms on there. But you only have to do research on chip providers and, and device providers to understand uh, what other great partners uh, actually provide solutions in the industry. But as I say, when you're particularly concentrating in cloud, then moving towards network function virtualization where all those uh, devices are now being looked at by organizations to become virtual within a cloud harness, hopefully an open stack in our eyes, um, then even more technology will be sold from their point of view through that capability. OpenStack is often seen by the vendors who are in the NFE market as a standard platform for delivering those capabilities. So it does indeed become very relevant to me as an OpenStack architect. And software-defined networking is obviously very, um, very vogue at the moment within the industry. It offers the abilities to move away from this very physically reliant um, relationship that we had with networking gives us far more control, far more flexibility when we're building our clouds. And obviously that's going to be an area that the ARM business would like to exploit as that develops. But servers is really where I'm at. So I worked essentially in most of my career around servers. Sysads when I first started many, many years, years ago, but quickly getting into software vendor and working on server type application sets. Latterly working on SUSE Linux Enterprise Server at SUSE. So I'm very familiar with the server market. And up until a few years ago, I didn't really see ARM as a serious contender. But then they brought out the ARM64 processor technology. Many vendors have started producing this technology, delivering it in server platforms. And it, although small acorns at the moment, for a pun, it's growing all the time and becoming more relevant. Again, like before, the approach most vendors have taken when using these technologies is to pick out single use cases. So I called out earlier, HPC, high performance compute, supercomputing, has been an area they've got initial good success traction in. And we'll talk a couple of references on that in a little bit. But importantly, they're using a land and expand type of logic, these vendors. So where they've been successful on one kind of market, they're increasing their um, view about the penetration into different models as they work forward. And because of that, SUSE is starting to see the predictions coming true that later this year, early next year, we're going to start seeing much more technology being driven by these kind of tech chips in the server space. Of course, that's very important for OpenStack. 
the more density, the more power, the more bang for the buck because of the cheap overall manufacturing costs in the product, suddenly it becomes a lot more relevant. Here, I'm going to be guilty of a Sousa flag wave. So vendors like Sousa have gone out of their way to work with the ARM vendors, the ARM chip vendors, and actually validate their technologies, the operating system and the softwares that we, software that we deliver to market, and validate it against this ARM 64-bit processor technology. And importantly, others are doing that as well. It's not just Sousa. I'm, I'm in the green, but I'm being very... Um, open today when I'm stood up here. So where, where does a server running this kind of technology become particularly applicable? Well, we talked about HPC and we talked about density as features which are quite useful within um, this possible technology that we're working on. And of course, within cloud, we are looking for quite dense solutions. We're looking to be able to drive as much virtual capability out of our cl cloud platform as we can. And often, one of the limiting factors of what you can achieve in your cloud is the cost of the physical hardware. So if you combine a technology which um, tends to have a low heat power ratio, allows you to put more density in there, and actually per individual wafer or chip, the costs are being driven down, suddenly becomes very interesting. As I said, 96 cores, Cambium, are delivering on a single server today into the market. They're down in the marketplace here today. You can talk to them in more detail about what their technology does. So you have got the ability to really get out there and drive um, cloud workloads. Also, so I've, I've talked about that. Sorry, I'm meandering. I did warn you at the start. Um, so then if you think about another use case, which is becoming more and more relevant to us when we're talking about cloud technology, the ability to drive containers as a service across organizations, really high density, really large cloud scale, suddenly kind of fits into that picture. So for me, definitely we're starting to get a convergence of the technologies. I did mention storage within this story as well. So guess what? So Software-defined storage runs on servers. So the object store being delivered in a lot of our clouds is a particularly applicable use case in an OpenStack architecture story. Swift and Ceph are obviously popular projects that we all talk about and deliver in our customer sites. And of course, they fit perfectly into this high-density, low-cost, kind of model. Good enough cattle analogy. All these things point towards this kind of technology possibly being very interesting to organizations. We can really drive out with resilience in those storage platforms across massive scale. And more and more vendors are looking to work in there. I know Cavium, HPE uh, are in this space. There's many, too many to to actually know, to be fair. Because the market itself, the analysts are saying, is going to be $4.72 billion at the moment. It's going to be even larger soon. And that's quite an incredible market, and of course, part of the driver of why ARM are thinking that they're going to drive heavily into this particular area. I talked about use cases earlier. So on the right-hand side here, on the lovely colored green um, slide that you get, or graph, it's just illustrating to you the particular workloads that organizations have particularly been picking off. Networking, we've already known about. It's an area that, that has been quite important to um, ARM. Obviously, they've been on storage. They're working more and more around HPC type models, supercompute, got a couple of references of that um, in a little while. But really, that, that graph is there to really articulate that they're moving forward. The vendors that are using this technology see great value in exploiting more and more areas of this market. On the left-hand side, there's just an illustration of 
how many chips are being driven. So there's been a massive spike moving forward as they're getting more and more relevant to the industry. So it's not me just seeing this and thinking it's a good idea. The industry itself is starting to adopt these technologies and move forward. And here's a quick slide. If this is SUSE orientated, I do apologize, fair disclosure. But these are the partners we've been working with when we were building our support for the ARM64 chip base with our operating system. So as you can see, there's, just, there's many of them. And importantly, the use cases against particular chips that they're delivering to market can be varied. And because of that, they can be very specialized and very ready for the particular use case you might feel you need a different solution to, to the one you might have thought about before this presentation, hopefully. One of the things that um, in the industry has been um, a perception, probably, is that because this technology has been used on a lot of small compute, the small devices, etc., that actually performance might be limited. But with the ARM64 chip, that actually is not true at all. And there's many examples. Cavium shared some examples with us as a vendor, a partner of theirs, where they've done a lot of um, tests, benchmarks against performance. And these, these chips really do perform against a lot of the workloads and use cases you're going to be driving in your clouds. They really do perform very powerfully um, in that area. There's quite a few people taking photographs. The slides will be available afterwards. So I'll move on to the next one. Right, so I said there's some use cases around um, high performance computing cloud. So surprise, surprise, Microsoft actually have been made a significant investment into ARM chip-based servers. They've done it in a restricted use case, though. But it's a cloud use case. So it validates more and more my story that for us building clouds, these things are relevant. So within um, the Azure cloud, Microsoft have made a very reasonable investment in this technology for them to have choices and to hit certain use cases um, more easily. Also, recently in the UK, there's a large educational uh, supercomputer cluster um, called Isambard. Isambard Brunel being the um, a architect, an engineer from the Industrial Revolution in the UK, a very famous guy in our, in our country. And uh, they've named the um, supercomputer they're going to deliver in the city where he's from originally um, after him. And recently, Cray announced, one of the partners of SUSE again, that they're driving that technology with ARM chipsets. Fujitsu, another big partner of SUSE's, we work with them very often in many, many different areas, have announced that their post-K supercompute cluster in Japan will be delivered utilizing ARM technology as well. In Europe, so the area that the UK decided to abandon only the other day, don't believe the hype, we're still part of Europe, we're just not part of the European community. So they've got the Mount Blanc project, obviously um, centered in France around the, the big mountain that they, they've got there. And that, that actually, or named after that area, but it's um, delivered by Samsung chips. And the thing I found really amusing about reading this press article uh, was the fact that they are the same chips, absolutely same chips, that are running the Chromebook that Samsung are delivering, which is a really interesting twist on this idea that you know, small devices don't necessarily apply to these bigger technology uses. Just a quick call out, one of the things SUSE did, my organization, they have paid me for me to be here and be very uh, non-biased, so a little bit of an advertisement at the end. Recently, we um, started delivering ARM64 operating system support, so if you're from a ARM64 vendor and you're looking for operating system support from Linux vendors, please talk to SUSE, we're downstairs in the marketplace again. And we've got the ability to deliver our SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, industry-ready, enterprise-class Linux across those technologies. 
We also, and this is a bit of fun for anyone who's a bit of a technologist, um, we also decided to take that capability and extend it to the Raspberry Pi. Now this isn't really a commercial endeavor, it was just a bit of fun from SUSE. Uh, it was announced at our big convention, SUSECon, that we have every, every autumn. By the way, this year we'll be in Prague, a beautiful city. If you want to come and join us, you're more than welcome. And there, Arm actually gave us a load of Raspberry Pis, the Raspberry Pi version 3s that are carrying the Arm 64 chip. And we put SUSE Linux Enterprise onto there and gave everyone in the community the access to the codes to allow them to update and get patch updates for that distribution to keep up to date with the code and run their Raspberry Pi effectively moving forward. Mine is my open VPN server back at home. So thank you very much, Arm, for giving me that. And if you want to play with Arm, we actually have had some commercial interest about this. So again, if you're a vendor who is using or coming up with a model where you will use a Raspberry Pi in industry, and supporting it yourself is too expensive, SUSE might have a model which will benefit you, so please do talk to us. But what about the cloud products we have? So SUSE um, have an enterprise storage range, and they fully support ARM 64-bit chips today, and go to market with some vendors on there. Um, that's a Ceph-based open source project that we deliver with that. And then there's our own OpenStack Cloud. That's on version 7 at the moment. And that technology has technology preview for ARM 64-bit chip. OK? It's only just coming out into the market. It's only just starting to get ahead of steam with the architects that are building clouds. So at the moment, we haven't gone full support, but we're hoping more and more technology will move across to this so we can very rapidly increase our level of support with the next version, okay? There's some of the partners that we work with. Just to uh, highlight, Sue's aside again, there are many other partners in the ecosystem with ARM, so please don't feel hard done to if you're not up on the screen. And thank you very much. I'm Simon Briggs. So we might have a few moments. No, we probably haven't got very long at all to uh, talk, take questions. But if you'd like, would you mind going to the stand and, and asking on the mic? It's just they'll get it on the recording, so. Hello. Hello. I'm just curious, uh, what are you using for the hypervisor? Because uh, I don't know if uh, KVM is already working on uh, ARM, but you definitely have a product ready to use. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, SUSE has the support for straight SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, which has got KVM within it. Um, so that support would work. There's also containers as an option as well. And certainly with Cavium, we've concentrated on the containers use case, workload use case within our technology stack. Um, there. So you have got choices around it. We also support the Zen hypervisor as well. Um, so SUSE, SUSE approaches the market a little different to others, and we do like to give organizations choice. Uh, and because of that, we've got a very varied selection of different architectures and products that you can use as the workload engine within your cloud technology. Does that answer your question? Yes, and um, the cloud product, is it available for uh, to try? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Can I just put it on some Raspberry Pis and uh, <laughs> have some lab environment the, for the Raspberry Cloud support, The Raspberry Pi support doesn't extend to the OpenStack cloud as of yet. But we can give you the technology in an appliance form to run on virtual machines for you to be able to evaluate even on a laptop or whatever. So we can build a full cloud uh, within a virtualized environment as a play pit, if you would like. Obviously, don't drive cloud services at scale out via that technology, but you know, at least you can experience it. If you want to come and talk to us down in the marketplace, there's lots of guys wearing this bright, livid green, and we'd be more than welcome, more than happy to talk to you about getting the technology, allowing you to play with it. With it. Thank you. Thank you. Not going to ask a question. Right. So. 
Anybody else out there? I think we're probably done for time, to be fair. Sadly, I have to fly out this afternoon, but I will be around till about four-ish this afternoon. So if you do see me, come and say hello. Always nice to talk to people. Oh, I might have a quick question from a man wearing an arm T-shirt. He's going to tell me how wrong I was with my research here. But. Uh, no, it's, it's more of a statement. Um, and just to get back to your question about virtualization, um, KVM and Zen are fully supported upstream uh, on ARM. Uh, and with Microsoft's recent announcement of Azure, you could draw some conclusion as to another hypervisor support there. Um, I can't confirm or deny anything, but uh, there's an element of common sense involved. Um, in addition to the SUSE booth, ARM also have a booth uh, down in the marketplace, so please swing by. Uh, we've got many partners uh, also helping out there, so depending on what your question is, uh, I'm sure we can get an answer for you. Thank you very much, Andy. Right, enjoy the rest of your summit. Thank you.